Hey, welcome everyone to another edition of Algorand Developer Office Hours. I'm your host tonight, Ryan Fox, and I'm joined here with Russ Mastino, my colleague here on the on the Algorand Developer Relations team. We are both Algorand Developer advocates. Russ is going to be presenting tonight for our mobile devs and C Sharp and Xamarin. Russ has got so much experience in the developing for Xamarin. He's actually an, uh, an author of Azure and Xamarin Forms. It's cross-platform mobile development. So uh, a book that you can find out there. Russ, really looking forward to what you have on offer for us today. Why don't you take it away? Thanks, Ryan. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> I feel like the uh, Chris Farley and the motivational speaker skit. been practicing all day, getting ready all day, and now I'm ready to deliver. We got the late hours tonight, huh? The late slot. Yeah, I don't really mind uh, doing these in the evening myself. I'm a more of a night owl. So, you know, it's funny because when I used to work at Microsoft, we did the seminars in the morning and the afternoon. And they said, which one do you want? Oh, definitely afternoon. They did IT pro in the morning and developer in the afternoon with the MSDN events. And I says, you developers like to sleep in. At least this developer does. So anyway, so here we go. We got some great content here tonight on uh, building with uh, Xamarin and C Sharp applications for Algorand solutions and mobile apps. So you built the web solution, right? Now what? When you're building solutions, you got to do the end-to-end -end thing. So what about iOS? And now I think when you submit an iOS app, it also will go to the Mac as well <clears throat> in the App Store. How about Android? How about Windows, UWP, desktop, tablet? Do I do this natively? Many of you are brand new to mobile development. That could be three or more sets of code. Do I do use that approach? I got to learn new skill sets. Maybe I don't know Objective-C or I don't know Swift. I don't know Windows with other languages that you can use to create applications. With one skill set, we'll take a look at how you can do a mobile dev. So the agenda here tonight is we are going to have the algorand.net SDK. We're going to show you we're going to show you that. And then also we're going to talk about using SDK using VS Code, and then specifically getting into building mobile apps with uh, Xamarin and uh, Visual Studio. All right, so a lot of tools being built out there by the developer community. There are SDKs which are in red here. These are all done by Algorand, and then we have community SDKs as well, right down below with Rust, PHP, Dart, C Sharp, Swift, and Unity. And that is the uh, lay of the land there. And then these are specific links to all the different community SDKs and all the different languages. The one we're going to be focusing is the one that highlighted here. This is the .NET Algorand SDK for C Sharp. And where do you find us and get started with? Well, you got the documentation under community projects. That's where you'll see a link. Our new website, notice in the upper right, now there's a login and sign up. You can sign up with uh, GitHub over there. We'll go ahead and do a documentation, go to community projects. And this is where you can find a lot of great information about the community, including the .NET SDK. So you can go ahead and you know, just click on that and you'll find it very easily. All right, so let's talk about using the SDKs in VS Code. Working in VS Code with C Sharp. So there is a tutorial wrote on the developer portal. If you, you are brand new to uh, using C Sharp with VS Code, maybe you're used to using Visual Studio as I was, it's pretty straightforward. You install a C Sharp extension, you generate assets for building for build and debug. That'll be under your view palette. Also under there is a place to use a NuGet package manager and you would search for Algorand to get the SDK. And then one little trick I recently discovered actually was to create um, a configuration. That part I've done, and that generates a launch.json file in the IDE. And uh, But there's a way to add your arguments for the token and URL in there that works nicely with the SDK for C Sharp. And I'm going to do a demo here, which involves debugging and uh, using a driver request. This is for smart contracts as well uh, as it, what it does is it bundles up accounts, signed transactions, and approval program source into what's referred to as a dry run request. And then you can use uh, the uh, teal debugger to go ahead and do that. And that's the command you would give from the command line. And in terms of VS Code, this is how you would go ahead and start add a configuration. It's under the debug icon on the left, the little arrow with the bug on it. 
and then you have the ability to add a configuration and just add in a .NET Core launch. Now, you might be asking, why am I talking about VS Code and doing console apps? Well, that's basically the samples that you have in the SDK. So I just cloned the SDK and make it a local copy of it and go ahead and attach the, the uh, .NET Core to it like I, I just suggested and then make a change in the uh, launch and launch JSON file to put in the arguments for the URL and your uh, token that you might have. So those that are brand new, you'll need those two items anytime you do SDK coding, including the C Sharp SDK. And then we're gonna interact with Chrome Inspect. And those of you that are running on a Windows machine, yes, you can create a node or you can use Sandbox on Windows as well. And there's a good uh, tutorial. I actually just went through that the other day, created a node on Windows in my Parallels VM. Also, you can run Sandbox as another way to run a node. So those will give you your node and URL values. So let's take a look at VS Code and using the .NET SDK. So first of all, lay of the land, like I mentioned, you would want to go and uh, look at your configuration. And in the configuration file, this is where I've got those two lines lined up for args. And if you look at the, the code, there is a place in the code that you would go ahead and specify that. And so that would be right up at the top. So here is where it reads the arguments in from the args that are passed in the main, which come from your launch file, and you're off and running. And the one section I'm going to show you here is actually doing the debugging. And you can see the makeup here on the left of the entire project, right? So there is the V2 folder for version two. There's a uh, contract folder for all the smart contract related samples. There's samples for doing assets, atomic transfers, indexer, rekeying, all that good stuff is available in the, uh, on the right on the repository under the SDK samples. So what I'm going to do here is I've already run this to create the, uh, the response file, the dry run response. I'm actually going to show you that in the uh, Xamarin app and how that's done. But all I'm going to do here is uh, show you that this is how you would run uh, this teal debugger. So the teal debugger is going to say, okay, I'm going to take the source code and then I'm going to go out to uh, Chrome inspect for the debugging. So let's go ahead and bring up a browser. Oh, there it is. Okay. And now you can see it's ready to go ahead and inspect. So this is going to actually bring up the teal that I, I am compiling into my dry run. And here you can see I've just got a global counter. I'm going to go ahead and put uh, increment one. And you can step through this. All right. So that finished up. And I did mention you want to also view the command palette. So first you would clone this project and then go to the command palette and then this is the one you want to select generate assets for build and debug this will generate the dlls that you would need to, to do the debugging and then secondly is the uh, package manager and then you would just type in algorand and then I hit enter and then you'll see it there listed okay so then you can just click on that and then the nougat pack package is there and one other tip, when I'm working with uh, GitHub, I also have, when you're dealing with Xamarin, you have these OBJ and bin files, which you don't have to push up. Those get recreated every time. So I just put those ignore files in, and this is the directory structure that I have. And you save that, and then you don't get cluttered up with a lot of OBJ and uh, bin files. Now let's get into what this session is about here. I do like to use that VS Code to test some of the code that in the console app because I know it works there, and then I could test it there, and then I would basically copy and paste it into my mobile app. That's how I built this thing, and it's really a good uh, practice, I think, this way it's working before you paste it in. All right, so new to Xamarin, many of you are. So it's the claim to fame is it builds cross-platform apps for iOS, Android, Windows, Mac, and more. If you are on a Windows machine, a few of them are, then you want to use Visual Studio 19, 2019 Community Edition. If you're on a Mac machine, there is Visual Studio for the Mac. However, there's doesn't have the ability to generate Windows apps in that environment, so you'd have to pick up Parallels or something like that, like I have, and then you could clone your project in there and, and do the Windows piece of that. Now, VS Code, you might be wondering, I just showed VS Code for console apps. That's great, but 
you cannot use that for the mono stack, which is Xamarin, what, the, what Xamarin was built on. VS Code does not support Xamarin. Multiple project solution is what you end up with. Uh, you have a head project, uh, which is a .NET, 2, .NET standard 2.0, which means it could be shared. It's shareable amongst all the other projects in the solution. Namely, you would have one for iOS, one for Android, and one for Windows. And what this facilitates is uh, roughly 95% code is shared. You only have to code it one time, and now you're building a cross-platform solution. And actually, the sample that I'm going to show you is closer to 99%. There's only like a couple lines in each that kick off the uh, run the application, and that's it. So really, for all intents and purposes, it's 100% shared code all the way. And the way this will look, I'm going to be showing you this through Visual Studio for the Mac. And if you look at number one up there, that's the uh, head project. That's where all the code is. And if you look uh, down below, you can see the different project types. One for Android, where number two is iOS and UWP. So those would be code specific. They're still all done in C Sharp. Uh, sometimes you would have to uh, use that if, with dependency injection. Uh, let's say you wanted to uh, utilize a feature in a web view control that wasn't brought up to the it's, it's a common lowest common denominator sometimes in those Xamarin forms, but you're still not stuck. You can get at that and uh, still use it and just put a specific code for that particular feature you might be looking for in Android, iOS, or UWP. And then you also have the code, right? You got the XAML, and then you have the code behind which is number three down there. And I have examples of those on the screen. So on the right side, you've got the XAML. That's the markup for the interface. So you can see a bunch of buttons are going to be on the screen. There's a web view control. And by the way, when this renders, it renders the native button for that platform. As you all know, Android is a different kind of button than iOS, which has a different kind of button than UWP. So all the native controls are rendered in the end, which is a beautiful thing. And then on the left is the code that's behind that particular uh, layout. So they're always paired together. You got the UI and XAML, and then you've got the logic for your app in the code behind. Now, there is one trick I used uh, to reading files and images. One thing about when you deploy a mobile solution to Android, iOS, and Windows, they all have their favorite place to read and write files to. And they're all different. And it means that's where you got to have a uh, different code for the different platforms to, and you have to put some special technique in to copy the, the files out of the project into that particular like sandbox kind of location that, that they use. One alternative is to use embedded resources. And now it's, instead of doing a physical file IO, you're actually uh, uh, compiling it into the DLL that you're building here and you're just gonna read it in memory. So it's faster and it's quicker and you only have to do it one place. And I do this for uh, all my files as well as my images. So you can take a look at number one down here. This is a teal file. And what you do is you bring up the properties for it where number two is in the upper and you select embedded resource. And then you can see how you refer to it in the code is the name of the project, the folder, and then the name of the file. And then up here is the actual code that you use to get a manifest resource stream. This is how you read an embedded resource. It's really only about a half a dozen lines of code here, but man, it makes your life a whole lot easier. Now, one downside of this is that it does make your DLL fatter, your project fatter. I remember when I first wrote the Jethro Tull endorsed app, it was huge. And it was to so big, it couldn't even, uh, I couldn't even upload it to the store. It was beyond all the limits. So that has lots of images and lots of big graphics in it. So I had to do a hybrid approach. I had to do download uh, some of the bigger images and then all the thumbnails I included in the app. So you got to go, may have to go through that process process. Also, iOS has the ability to take the ping files and maximize the amount of space that, that you have left over after using it. So it really minimizes the amount that goes into the DLL. All right, so let's get into the application here tonight. So we got iOS, um, iPad and iPhone factors. And you can see we've got different sections here. We've got node settings, doing accounts, and doing standard assets, and, and transfers. All the layer one features we're actually going to show you. So those that are brand new to Algorand tonight, you're going to get a taste of all the different uh, layer one features. 
Then you got uh, Android. So that's the Android look and feel. And this is the UWP or Windows version. And so you could see here, I've got like, here's the uh, UWP version. I got that running in my Windows 10 VM. And then here is, I've got this running here. This is my uh, version for Android. So they're all working. And then where do you store the keys? This is the age old question. No matter what type of solution you build, you always got to figure out what am I going to do with the private keys? Well, there's a secure storage class, and this is part of the Xamarin Essentials Nougat package. And uh, James Montemago wrote all of these, and uh, I used to work with him when I worked for Xamarin for a little bit. And then also you see the uh, place where they would go. So if you were actually building a wallet type app, this would be a good class to utilize. And then the solution, I do have a solution written up on the developer portal. The code link is updated. And those that are brand new, what we're going to be caught talking about in this is uh, st Algorand Standard Assets, ASA. These are your tokens uh, or NFTs, non-fungible tokens, which are like collectibles, fungible tokens, which are like uh, coins, for example. We're going to be talking about atomic transfers where you can wrap multiple transactions into one, all happen or no, no happen, none happen. Also, you have Algorand Smart Contracts or ASC1. And this is uh, both, you have two flavors, stateful and stateless. And then uh, rekeying, and we're going to show you all these demos here now. So demo using Visual Studio for building uh, cross-platform apps in iOS, Android, UWP. So we're going to bring up the code and bring up iOS. So let's just go ahead and fire this up. And goes ahead and brings it up in the emulator. I got an iPad emulator here on the right. And the first piece I'll show you is where you would want to uh, establish the settings for your application, which would be up in here, node network settings. So this sample can go to testnet or beta net on uh, the pure stake testnet. There's a hackathon instance that we provide for hackathons, or you can enter your own node. So this would be like the equivalent of local host. However, when you're running a mobile app, you can't just put localhost and then colon 4001. You have to use the actual IP address of your machine. So if you're on Windows, start up a command line, type in IP config, and then I'll tell you what your IP address is for the Mac. It's under network. So just bring up this network button right there, and then you'll see the IP address, and that's the one you want to use. We're going to use Hackathon here and uh, Testnet. Now, under accounts and transactions, I've already generated three accounts. And you can click these buttons to get the account values. Uh, you can see the totals there on these accounts. We're going to create a multi-sig address so you can see the account creation process in the app. But first, I'm going to just simply do a transfer between account one and account two. And you can see I have got the breakpoints preset. And this is going to then utilize this payment transaction right here. So we got from account one going to an account two, there's the amount we're going to specify. Let me go ahead and get right down there. You can see these populated. So we're going to do one algo, that's uh, micro algos is what's there. So it's 1.000000. And then we got a little uh, transaction parms get sent in there. The next step is going to be to sign that transaction. And the final step will be to broadcast it or submit it to the network. And then uh, you wait for it to complete. And I'm just going to set a breakpoint right down there and let it uh, continue running. So after this completes, again, blocks are burned in under five seconds. So that's about how long it takes. And there we are. We've got it coming back. So now you can actually see the, the transaction was a success there. Then let's go ahead and create a multi-sig address. So a multi-sig address is like you take a check to the bank and you need two signatures, right? So here you need signatures to sign off on an account. And so the multi-signature then is basically this. You would have three keys, public keys. You're going to add a, a number of those into the multi-sig. And we're going to add in a threshold of two is what we're two of those public keys have to say yes. So we're adding into this public keys collection, three of those. And then all we're going to do then is the same process. Every time you're going to go ahead and sign, uh, seal and deliver. And so now that's created. And then we sign with the multi-sig address down over here. There's a get balance function. And then you can see it actually was created. 
So what you do is you would need to have that that created in order to do uh, that funded in order to do transaction. In fact, you would see this funded needed button when you do this from scratch with account one, two, and three. Go to fund needed. This will pop out to the browser. It'll pass in the account automatically. Oh, they gave me an easy one today. I can't believe it. Wow. All right, verify that. All right, boom. And now this is a dispenser, basically. It's available. There's one available for testnet and one for beta net. And we'll go back to the app. And then you can see that this has that balance in it. So now let's try to do, uh, now that we got the account created, let's go ahead and do an actual transaction. So we're going to do a transaction where we have two approvals out of the three, and we're going to send funds to account number three. And so there you see the get payment transaction when you're using the multi-sig that's going to be coming from that address to the destination address, which we got listed above. And then now you can see the information come down right below that we were successful in doing that. So that's the, the lowdown of accounts as well as regular transactions and multi-sig transactions. Next, what we're going to do is we are going to show you the grand standard assets. So on this, we're going to go ahead and start creating an asset. And after we create an asset, you can configure it, opt in, do transactions. So this, again, is your, your tokens that we talked about up front. And this is how you create it. There is a create asset transaction function that we're going to utilize. And we're going to send in the structure, which is going to have the name, the unit name, whether it's frozen or not, and then a total number, the number of decibels, URL, and a meta hash. And then also we're going to assign manager to the account to dress string. And let's go ahead and hit run. And then we should be able to see the asset index come back right here. And there it is. So we're going to go ahead and display that. And there you can see the index down below. And by the way, you could copy these. You just press and copy. I used a web view control in this to give you that capability. If you use a label, you can't copy it. And if you use a entry field, it could be modified. So this is the only solution that I know that do, does both. That's what I've used. So now we can configure this role. So if you look down below, we got IW. And everybody else is 3Z, right? 3Z and 3Z. And what we want to do is change this manager role to provide us with um, that particular function. So we're just going to make this one change. And now it comes up. And now you can see that the manager role now, you have the creator, you've got the clawback, you got the frozen, and here's the manager. This is that IEW one, all right? And all the rest are, are, are set to that now for that particular function, just for the manager. The freeze is still set the way it was, and so is the other one uh, still set the way it was. All right, so now we, what you have to do is you have to opt in. So this is our anti-spam protection. And the anti-spam protection that you see here now is I'm going to go from account three to, with this asset ID, and I'm going to go ahead and opt in using this opt in transaction method call. So now this says, I want to be able to accept this asset. And you got to sign off on it basically there to, to do, make that happen. So that's a good feature. So you can see I've got an asset amount of zero. So now what I'm going to do is do a transfer, just like we saw a transfer of funds before, of algos. Now we're going to do a transfer of assets. So there you see, we got, we're going from address one, we're going to address three, there's the asset ID. So everything is lined up, sign in transaction, and then broadcast it. This is nice wait uh, transaction to complete method. So your code will hang on that line until it gets done, which is nice. You won't get ahead of yourself there. And so now you can see the amount here is 10 on the display here. So we actually did this transfer successfully. Now you can also do a freeze command, a freeze, freeze the asset. So maybe you're writing a game, you want to cause some penalties to maybe freeze this person you know, temporarily so they can't send or receive assets. You have that ability to do it or do a clawback in some of the other business transactions perhaps. All right, so now you got the freeze uh, frozen flag is set to true down here, and then we're going to go ahead and revoke the asset, 
And now we got to revoke the asset transaction as well. And that is going to do a clawback. So you can still do a clawback even though the account is frozen, but you cannot do transactions from that account. In other words, sending or receiving from that account. This is going to be uh, taking it back to the master account. So now the account three now has zero of those. It took that 10 back. And then finally, we'll destroy the asset. Now we've done the whole life cycle basically for assets in the application. All righty. So now the account is destroyed. So let's go back over to this app once again. The next thing we can take a look at is atomic transfers. So with atomic transfers, we're going to use account one and we want to send to both account two and account three. And this is how you do it. So we got basically two transactions, TX and TX2. So TX is going to go from account one over to account two. And the second transaction is going to go from account one to account three. And both of these have to be successful or neither of these will work. That's how it works. And so this is the glue. You're going to cr uh, create a uh, group ID. And then we're going to assign the TXs to that group ID, the sign both the transactions. Uh, and then over here, we're going to then encode that and message pack them. So we have the signed TX going to go ahead and go in. And then we're going to add the second one in into that same transaction and then use that in the uh, call for the to actually do this. So now it's going to go ahead and run this. And so now both of those accounts will receive the funds. And you can see the account one balance was 8518 5, And this one here ends with 7,000. So that's the two that it sent that we had in the uh, list. All right. It slices, it dices, it does more. Let's take a look at smart contracts. These are stateless smart contracts. There are two types, contract account and delegate. So the contract account, we're going to read in a, a program. The program is Teal. And basically, this is simply an int one. This is going to return uh, true. And so if the smart contract returns true, that's the same as basically it's going to be able to sign it. If it returns false, it's not going to be able to sign it. All right, so that is going to complete, and there is the success. If I went back there and changed that to this bit here to a zero and reran it, it would fail the logic. It's not returning true. But the way Teal works is it will evaluate to whatever left on the stack at the end. So if you have a true value, you're good to go. Now, with account delegation, it's very similar, but in addition to returning true, it also has to have a sign-off by an account. So this maybe you've got a, a board member or an account that's got to go ahead and sign off on that in addition to the logic happening. So that would be a purpose of this one. So there's the signing. And then you have the signed address with the payment transaction that you'd be sending it from. And you're going to be utilizing the, uh, the logic seg. You're actually signing it right there. So that's a success as well. And now all the V2, uh, new V2 stuff has recently come out. Uh, first, we'll start with compiling Teal. And so here uh, I've got a compile Teal button. And here's where I talked about getting uh, the, the resource for the uh, file that you have up in the uh, properties, right, that we had for the embedded resource. And then over here, this is where we're, we're going to uh, show you the uh, Teal compile command. So this data is simply going to read in this TL program, which is under the contract folder here. And it's just in one. And then what we're going to do is uh, take that response and we're going to print off the hash and the result. And there they are. So there's the hash and the result. So that's the uh, compile. So we'll have the need uh, to do compilation uh, in your code sometime. So it's very simple. It's just a client SDK. Rust API call to do a teal compile on that particular file. And that's it there. Now let's go back to the next one here, which is indexer. This one's fun. So indexer is used to query the, the blockchain. 
And basically, it does it by not actually querying the blockchain itself. It queries a uh, Postgres uh, SQL database that you populate with data. So you're actually accessing a database. And there are services that you can use to get at this, uh, PureStake and RAN Labs. You can run, you can create your own. It's available in the sandbox now too, in the default environment. All right, so let's do a account lookup. So there you can see the account is lookup by ID and there's an address it's going to be looking up. And there's the data that comes back. Let's look for account transactions. Same thing. Now this is going to use the indexer, a lookup account transactions. There's a limit that you could specify there, two of 10. So you just get uh, 10 replies back and you can see each reply going in line here. There's 10 replies there. Now let's look for search for applications. So these are smart contracts that would be stateful smart contracts. So you can see the search for application call. Again, you have a ability to put a limit that you bring back. And maybe you wanna look at a particular application ID. So that would just go ahead and pass in uh, the app index to the, into the lookup function. So that would be uh, what you would get uh, down over here. Finally, you could search for assets as well. So this will bring all the assets uh, back for 10 for a unit of lat, so you can do uh, filters. And then also, if you, if you wanted to build like a top 10 uh, leaderboard of assets, this is how you do it. You'd use Indexer to build that kind of a solution. And the last one here is just look up by asset ID. So I'm just gonna pull the first asset off of that and look that up. So that completes the Indexer uh, demos. And then oh, this is interesting. So rekeying allows you to rekey an account far as the private key goes or the signing key. So you can have a public key and a private key pair. And let's say you, you grow and you go from an individual account and maybe you want a multi-sig account to, to sign it off. In the old days, you had to recreate both the public and private key and redo everything. And we're the only blockchain that offers the ability to swap out the, who signs the private key. And this is how it works. We're gonna first opt in on account three to have account one. And here's the code. And this is what I'm talking about. So you have account three is gonna sign this TX. If, and, this, and the code here is going to do a payment transaction from account three to account three. It, so it's going from and to itself. But what we want to do is we want to rekey it to account one so account one can send it or sign off on it. However, that's not in effect yet. And the signer on this is still account three. So this is going to be uh, the one that gets signed. So now that's done, right? So account three opts in to have account one signed for it. Now what I'm going to do is actually do that. I'm going to have account one sign it and then have three send it. And the way this works is I've got account three up here is going to send to account two. The rekey is going to be from account one. And there is account one actually doing the signing as build. Then if you're doing this demo and you want to do it at home, there's a reset account, or you may want to know, gee, can I go back and reset the uh, to the way it was where account three is the one that's uh, sending and signing? So that'll do basically the same thing, but reverse order. Now we did it in the first step, and here we're going to have account three to account three with the rekey to account three. However, account one is still signing at this point. So he's got to sign it. This will be the last time that he signs it. But after that, you're good to go. And that is the rekey demo. All right. Well, I like to build things to a crescendo here in my demo. So this is the stateful contract. So this is the life cycle you go through. You create an app. You opt into using the app. And the app is going to have teal code, basically. And I'll show you that in a second. And then we're going to call the app and execute it. There's local, global, state. So local is at the account level, global is at the blockchain level. And then you have the ability to update the app. And then we're going to call the updated app and read the local state again and close out. And basically all we're doing in this solution is the initial app is going to have a timestamp. I can show you that over here. All right, here's the initial teal. So this is your stack based language. 
and there is no teal uh, nougat package for VS Code. There is one uh, for Visual Studio. There is one for uh, VS Code, and you saw me uh, search for that nougat package for Algorand. So you'd get text completion, highlighting, and all that stuff. So the only difference between this initial approval program and the refactored one is in the refactored one, we're going to add an uh, pass in a argument that is going to have a timestamp on it. So then you can see the timestamp right here. So we're going to call that field timestamp. We're going to do a local put. So it's going to be local storage is going to have that. That's really the only difference. Everything else is just uh, basically a simple counter. All right. So let's go ahead and create the app. All right. And so what we've done here is we've taken those three files I just showed you and we've read them in. And this is my, this is the uh, resource that I talked about, the embedded resource. And then what I have here is the, I, I called attention to the fact that the address is hard coded in, in those teals as part of the contract. So if you did change the, you'll have different addresses when you do this on your own. So you would just have to make sure you go through and uh, change that to get the work like these addresses here would have to change. So now you've got the ability, you're going to compile, use teal, teal compile, all three of these, and then we're going to use these in our application. Oh, now here's the call to create the app. So this is the creator account, is the uh, which is account one. Uh, we have the teal program, which is the instance of that particular object. And we're going to go ahead and feed in the approval program as well as the clear program. And then there are four variables. You have the local ints and bytes are the two data types. And then you also have ints and bytes for global. So a pair for uh, local and a pair for global. Ints has got one we're using, and but zero on, on the bytes. So that's it. And then I just hit uh, continue here. And this should go ahead then and return back a application ID. And there it is. Now we're going to opt in. So the opt in will go ahead and, and go to a similar call, and it will actually be application opt in and the sender address, and then the application ID gets populated in there. And that's it. So now you can see I am opted in. So now let's go ahead and call the app. So this is going to execute. And if you can see here, I've, I've got the uh, application call transaction is the method call. Again, the application ID will be a parameter to all of these and then who's sending it. So now you can see that was a success. So now what this did was this created some local state and some global state in that teal program. So now you can see the uh, local state. We're simply going to look at the application local state here that we're getting from the response of apps local state on the account response that we get from the account information. Oh, I don't want to do an update. Not right now. You better not. Close. <laughs> Always oh, at the boasted upper two types. So there you can see the information here is not much, right? You just got the teal value, you've got two bytes, two byte fields, one one int field, like we saw st stated in the schema. And then the global would be the global state. So very simple, or, uh, simple, or similar. And the same thing, you got two and one. So now let's update the app to include that timestamp. So the update call is basically this. You do update application with the approval program that I'm passing in now is actually the, the one for the uh, for the updated one. All right, so that was successfully updated. So now let's call the updated app. It's beautiful that you can update these. And now well, we could see that we have the application call transaction up above. And then that was also a success. So now if we look at the local state, you could see there's a little bit more in it, right? That we have, uh, in fact, you've got another integer there from the local state being added. And then also the key value for the timestamp that is in there. And then finally, you can close out the, uh, the app and be done with everything. Okay. So that is it. And then you could see it's been uh, closed out. If you're new to Algorand, we do have lots of reward programs. There is a link uh, to this deck at the end I'll show you, and we'll also put it into the, uh, the chat window. 
but a lot of grant programs, developer rewards, ambassador rewards for developer program, and then also Algorand Scouts and security. We do have another developer office hours coming up. Every other week uh, we do these. And this is where all the code is from today. You've got the .NET Community SDK. Riley has done a great job on this uh, Community SDK. I think there's only one outstanding issue I have up there. I, I, I found a bug on uh, working with assets using the pure stake. There was a header problem and he's working on that to solve that. But all the other node types work very nicely. And uh, it's solid. I, I've gone through and tested it all through through writing this particular application. The sample C, C Sharp app that I just did showed you is under the Algorand dash DevRel. And then also a solution that I got to update the uh, content on. But the link at the bottom is good, which is the uh, solution that brings you up there. Discord, we all invite you to join Discord. I think this will be a great opportunity for you to engage with the community. There's several thousand developers now on Discord. Also, we have the developer portal, the forum, GitHub. A PowerPoint link is right there. Maybe, Ryan, you could paste that into the chat window, the PowerPoint, so everybody has that. Yep. And then sign up for office hours like you did today at algorand.com slash developers. These are the resources, the, all the, there's uh, VS Code tutorials for every language, great community tools. Also, you've got really a lot of, it's a very strong community. So in summary, what we saw here today is using the, the algorand.net uh, community SDK, where it's at, how to download it. We showed a little bit of the developer portal with a lot of other community resources. Uh, then we looked at using the SDK with uh, VS Code and how to start testing uh, C Sharp inside of VS Code. For those that are, are new to that environment, we had to do the build with the, the viewing the palette. And then also we had to use the NuGet package to download that. Also, I didn't mention that, but inside of Visual Studio, you, you would select right mouse click on the solution and you would say uh, manage NuGet packages. And there's where you would do the search for the Algorand NuGet, which you need for, for this project. So just like you have to add it in the VS Code, you got to add it into your solution for Visual Studio. And then we ended with a whirlwind tour of really all the layer one features in, in one session on a sample Xamarin Mobile application using Visual Studio. And I use Visual for Studio for the Mac. And I also develop on Windows as well in my uh, Parallels VM. I found uh, Parallels to work pretty good. VMware, I, I had to struggle with it to get it to work and I ended up going, I compared the two and I just ended up going with, with Parallels. So uh, if you, anybody's like broaching that bridge, that, that was my findings on those two products. And then we looked at accounts, doing transfers, doing multi-sig transfers, doing assets, as well as atomic transactions. We did smart contract. We did some compiler stuff. We did debugging with Teal Debugger and lots of great things there. This, once again, is the PowerPoint. I'm going to leave it on the slide and uh, appreciate if you can uh, scan that QR code in and give me some feedback on the session tonight. Really would appreciate it. Great stuff, Russ. We really appreciate you uh, staying up late tonight and joining our international crowd across the globe here for another developer office hours.